Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70 Philadelphia's long-standing advocate for better politics and better government here in the city and in Harrisburg. Primary election day coming up May 21st. A lot of candidates, a lot of offices, uh, going through what we think of as an extended series of job interviews. That's what this is about. Voters, uh, the hiring committee, if you will, getting to, to talk to uh, different candidates about their, their past, their present, and their future. And uh, we have uh, another city council at large candidate today, Erica Almiron. Erica, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me here, David. I appreciate All it. All right. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to spend about 15 minutes with Erica talking about her uh, past, uh, present, and, and future. So, Erica, let me start with this is the most basic question mm -hmm. uh, that has uh, kind of tripped up some folks even at the highest levels of national government because uh, mm -hmm. they, they don't seem to be able to deliver an authentic answer to this question, but why are you running for city council? I mean, I think that, you know, um, and I'll tell a little bit more about my story as a, as a Latina, as a mm -hmm. woman of color, as somebody who is the daughter of immigrants and who has been doing social justice work for the last 20 years. I feel like there are two things that are really important to me. One is about representation. I think it is about time that we have women of color who are leading government. I've seen you know, the ways that we have responded to the women at the federal level who have now been introduced and how that's changing the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that is extremely important. I also think that for me, there is a moment in the history of this country where we need to take back the, the rhetoric and we need to take back the conversation. That's about loving people, believing in people. That's about doing the right thing that I'm not hearing at the federal level mm -hmm. and at the national level. And I've always believed and I've seen that Philadelphia can be a beacon and an example to the nation. And I've seen that in my work on immigrant rights work and I've seen my, that work on criminal justice issues. So I'm excited to get in and move the city in the direction that becomes the example for the nation to fight so for the this people. Is, uh... Philadelphia and particularly city council in Philadelphia leading by example. Completely. Yeah, and I've seen it. My work in immigrant rights when we've done to fight for a sanctuary city policy in 2014 when we were able to mobilize thousands of people to fight for the right things. Mm -hmm. We became the most progressive sanctuary city in the country and our policy was replicated at 200 other municipalities across the country. Mm -hmm. I've seen it firsthand. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, city council is a legislative body. Uh, what you end up doing is considering and voting for or voting against particular ordinances that then are, go to the mayor's desk uh, and if approved become the law for uh, the city. So, so translate your, uh, your interests, your sort of your big picture interests into the, what kind of legislation would you like to see moving through council that, that you would that you would always support or that which you would never support? Right. Specific pieces of legislation. So a lot of my work has been in fighting for communities of, who have been the most left out of the electoral proce process. Uh, that includes immigrants, people of color, poor people. So all of the policies that I would recommend would be in support of the people who need it the most, right? Um, my, my issues that I've been fighting on and talking about have been education, uh, criminal justice reforms and housing. And I think the, the hot issue right now that I firmly believe we need to address is the tax, the tax abatement, the 10 year tax abatement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a firm believer that if I have to pay my property taxes in the city, then I also believe that luxury developers should also be paying their property taxes in the city because that's the money that goes to our schools. Uh, it is fuel gentrification. So all of the policies that we need to think about are ending the 10 year tax abatement. How do we talk about rent control in our city? as it's gentrifying this fast, over 50% of the city is renters. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are policies that we need to think about when it comes to how much more can we create sanctuary in the city? How do we talk about criminal justice reforms and, and in the budgeting process, reprioritize our spending. We should not be actually spending so much money on locking people up when our schools are this underfunded. Yeah. Uh, you, the last point you made, I, I, I saw in today's Inquirer, there was a, a new poll, uh, issues poll that the Inquirer uh, put out that said the number one issue on people's mind is, is crime. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder how you respond to that, how that fits into your kind of a policy platform 
what, if that's what's on people's minds and if that's, maybe you're hearing something different. Yeah. What, do, what are we doing about that? I mean, I think there's a couple of things, right? Crime to me, I mean, I grew up poor working class. Um, I've had friends of mine when I was younger who got caught up in the drug wars. And I think reasons people get involved in a lot of crime is because of poverty, right? And we haven't addressed poverty in this city. I think if people felt like they had their human rights respected, if they had a roof over their head, if they had food on the table and they had a job that paid them at least $15 an hour, you would see crime rates just kind of plummet in the city. Mm -hmm. And then I also think that we have not done the work to think about alternatives to addressing violence um, and harm caused in our communities outside of incarceration. And that is why the country has so many people locked up because we think it's the solution and it hasn't been. If anything, it's become a way to just keep making money off of locking people up. So I would love to see more investment in restorative justice practices and abilities to address yeah. harm. Have you, uh, in your experience, because uh, you, you mentioned budgets, at the end of the day, again, city council and the mayor come together to spend, depending on the account, somewhere between five, 10, $12 billion a year on Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. what, what specific policy proposals around criminal justice do you think uh, work mm -hmm. and, and deserve more funding and, and which should we be, uh, you know, casting aside? I mean, a third of our budget is a public safety budget, right. right? I think we need to do away with low level policing and the broken window policing that we've seen be the fuel for mass incarceration in the city. So I would, I would address, you know, what is policing doing in, mm -hmm. in, this, in the city of Philadelphia? And I would also think about, um, we, are, we actually have a situation where if we end cash bail, we have less people that are sitting inside of our prisons because then people can actually be free while they're waiting trial. Mm -hmm. um, people shouldn't be locked up because they're poor. And so I think that, and then we should be investing in things like reentry programs. Mm -hmm. How are we supporting people who are coming out? How are we investing in taking away people's old drug convictions? I mean, the, the concept that like everybody's talking about legalizing marijuana, you know, I'm seeing it, the state's talking about it, but yet people are still sitting in jail for old convictions on marijuana charges. So why do we address the past as we move forward? Yeah. Well, as you know, we went through, uh, in hindsight, uh, kind of some unfortunate thinking, maybe uh, mid nineties, late nineties, uh, dealing with what some folks were calling super predators at the time, mm -hmm. the sense that ju juveniles were, were uh, con uh, committing an awful lot of crimes. We had to lock them up and pass mandatory minimums and so forth. And I suspect that's one source of uh, the um, folks that you're talking about. Completely, right yeah. completely. And how do we address having programs for young people? I've done youth organizing and youth development for the last 15 years young people are looking and are hungry to develop and learn and how do we create more spaces for them like that? How do we get some of these guns off the streets? Especially, I think that there's a conversation to be had about gun safety and what is it that it looks like to really be having ways that just, not just anybody can access a gun, right. you right. know? So let's talk about your experience, your, 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 your history, your, your track record. What are the, you know, what's the short list two, three accomplishments that you're most proud of in your professional life that you think would translate well into your role as a city council person? Yeah. I mean, I would say, I would start with one. I am the daughter of immigrants. I was born in South Philly. Um, I have a lived experience of growing up working class that just is a, not a professional, but a lived experience that people understand. When I go in, I know exactly what people are talking about when they want changes. My, my professional experience has been 20 years of social justice work. For the last eight years, I've been the executive director of Juntos, an uh, immigrant rights organization in South Philadelphia. We were the leading force in fighting for the sanctuary city policy. I was at the head of building the coalition that fought for that policy, which Maria Quinones and uh, the current mayor, Kenny, were the ones who introduced some of that legislation on the floor for us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very proud of where we are as a city on some of these policies that protect immigrants. I think there's more that we could do. Um, I'm also very proud of the fact that my work in education, when I was at the Philadelphia Student Union, led to the conversations of a costing out study 
and is now the base that created the conversation of how do we fully fund our schools mm -hmm. and how do we address the discrepancies at the state level. Yeah. What have you learned about uh, advocacy, uh, about uh, speaking out, organizing, building coalitions? Because uh, folks, it's not lost on anybody that when you're a member of city council, if, if you've got an idea, you're going to need at least eight colleagues, if not uh, 11 colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to side with you uh, in order for that to become law. So yeah. uh, how would you translate your sense of advocacy and coalition building? I mean, I've been wildly successful in building coalition. Um, I have a lot of relationships across the city uh, with some of the most marginalized communities and impacted communities. That ability to build coalition is about patience and it's about demanding the right thing mm -hmm. um, and building long-term relationships. And I think that I can do that very effectively inside and also that I know that if we have a strong outside that's pushing for the right things, that at some point, we're maybe on council having a conversation, but that the idea of co-governance is that the people on the outside are pushing us as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to think about a, a council person like myself who can bring the people in with them. And so that they're no longer an outside constituent, but they're a constituent on the inside. Yeah. From the outside, I'm curious what you think is, what's the most, can you think of an experience um, the, some kind of a, a town hall, community organization, I mean, community meeting, some kind of a civic engagement experience with, with an elected official that you think yeah. went particularly well? Because mm -hmm. uh, my observation is most of those don't go very well. Right, right. <laughs> There's a lot of heat and not uh, a whole lot of light. But mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, because that's, again, if you're an elected official, you're trying to, as you said, sort of bring people in and mm -hmm. make sure that they're heard and so forth. So w what do you think works well there? I mean, we had one this past summer uh, at Juntos uh, around the PARS campaign that we had, which was to get ICE out of our arrest database. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this amazing moment where Mayor Kenny actually came in to speak with immigrant leaders. Um, and so it was a bilingual event, which was one of the important things to create the space. It was led by community so that it, as opposed to like having a dynamic where the elected officials doing all the talking, mm -hmm. It's actually the communities doing all of the talking and in the language that they're most comfortable in. Um, and I actually believe that it was in that moment where Mayor Kenny got to hear from community members on the ground about what their experiences were like around deportations, that it was the eye opener. Hmm. It was the moment that he made the decision. Um, you could see it on his face. He was moved. And that's what we need. We need more moments where elected officials are talking to community members. Right not where community members have to come into City Hall to talk to us. Yeah, yeah, good. So let me turn to uh, another set of issues. Uh, our organization, a lot of folks that we have talked to are concerned that uh, there's not enough transparency and accountability in, in City Council. Uh, we talk about, uh, a lot of folks have talked about council medic prerogative and uh, how often, not always, but often, the decisions made by between council people and local developers are hidden from view. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about transparency in council itself, that it's not always clear from the outside where bills are moving or how they're being amended, how council spends its own money. Uh, we talk about a whole set of things that seem to shut people out of the election process. We mm -hmm. don't allow independent voters to vote. Um, we, you know, the, your position on the ballot, as you probably know, uh, is hugely important I've and heard. it shouldn't be so. Mm -hmm. So just interested in your thoughts on those issues or if you've got other ideas about how to make sure that the, the process is, is open, accessible, accountable. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the last couple of years I've learned a lot about the budget process, mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to one, understand it, two, how to insert yourself where you can actually get yourself on the record. Um, I think having a more open budgetary process is gonna be hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we should think about, I don't wanna, I didn't wanna, I don't wanna stay at a job for more than, you know, a few years. Cause I think after a while you start kind of to lose your juice. That's another thing I forgot to mention yeah. is term limits. We yeah. somewhat reluctantly, but we came out in, in favor of term limits uh, uh, for that reason alone. You just. You want to keep the energy going. Well, you wind up being a part of this machine, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that like 
new blood is always is exciting and will come in with fresh eyes. And I think having term limits are gonna be really, really important. Um, transparency in, enough so that like city council people are talking more to community in a way where like they, the people get to judge and also give influence on how to spend money, um, on what policies are important. Um, and also I think, and this kind of idea of co-governance, right? Mm -hmm. So like if I were to get elected, I have you know a coalition now of grassroots organizations that have been supporting me and backing me in this and they would be a part of the process for me. I can't build anything without the people telling me what they think needs to happen. So yeah. I could imagine quarterly meetings with community members and constituents on these issues. Yeah, they just don't vaporize and go away once you become elected or, or if it were to happen, that be at your peril. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap, uh, Erica. Thanks for joining us Thank here. Thank you. And uh, as I said, we have a primary election May 21st. Uh, make, make, <laughs> make a plan to vote. Encourage your friends and your family uh, to make a plan to vote. Um, if you want to know more about issues and candidates, take a look at our World Class Voters Guide at 70.org. Or you can download our We Vote app uh, onto your phone so you have in the palm of your hand everything you need to be a super voter on election day. So uh, thanks for joining us and see you at the polls. Thank you.